Yes. Four. You speak English here. <laughs> Welcome again to this uh, continued course in event logistics. Today we will talk about forecasting. This is chapter two of the textbook on Omnios. Um, my plan is roughly like this. First I will start introducing a little bit more about the need for these forecasts. And, and then uh, <coughs> some general features of forecasts, a little bit of different methods. We will focus on two different methods, what is referred to as causal methods and time series methods. Uh, finally, we will discuss some error measurements and that will be a part of the whole thing actually. So, so it's kind of woven in together uh, in the whole list here. Mm. We talked yesterday briefly about uh, this demand part of logistics and uh, it's extremely important to kind of understand that if you want to, to, to make plans for producing something, whether it's a product or an event, whatever, you need to have forecasts for the demand. At least if you want to use the possibility of inventory or if you want to make your customers happy. In most cases, making profit is uh, closely related to having happy customers. So in that perspective, uh, the need to produce reasonable demand forecasts is extremely important in logistics theory. Uh, as we discussed yesterday briefly, um, if you want to arrange something uh, and you don't know how many people who come and it's of course very hard to decide on what to buy or various stuff uh, what kind of technological equipment is needed how many seats do you need all this stuff is of course critically dependent on some measurements of uh, how many people you believe will come obviously also the same in classical production if you want to launch a product and uh, let's say you want to launch a new mo cell phone uh, you you have no idea how many will buy it of course there's there are two options either you produce too little in that case there's a lot of unhappy customers knocking on your door wanting to buy the product alternatively you produce too many in that case you have kind of shuffled money out of the window because you're kind of sitting on large storage storage volumes of cell phones who probably will not be sold anyway so, so this necessity of being able to handle demand forecasting is obvious in logistics. And basically, demand is the main factor we look at for uh, logistics. Uh, the textbook briefly talks about some other objects or variables we would like to forecast. Let us very briefly look at them. Variables to forecast in logistics. The prime candidate, the big number one, is demand. And in the sense we think here, we th you should think of demand as the number of units sold. Whether the units is uh, cars or seats for an event. Okay, that's that's the kind of demand which we look at here. So it's kind of a straightforward interpretation of this term here. Uh, the textbook also adds needs for raw material. Of course now we are in a situation where we look at classical production, meaning that you want to transform some kind of raw material into some new product. And of course in that sense you need to have some forecasts on what you need here. Because you have to buy these raw materials, it should be present at the moment you want to transform them by your production. But of course, this variable here is critically dependent on this one, isn't it? 
if you know you need to kind of know how many to sell to plan what raw materials to buy at the right time so this is not kind of, it's not a kind of isolated variable it's kind of a variable which is kind of deduced from these need and the same with all these other variables which are discussed in the textbook for instance uh, <coughs> needs for working power if you like people of course again the number of people you need to perform your transformation is again of course critical linked to how many products you believe you will sell uh, there is needs for capital you will typically for instance need to buy this raw material maybe even prepay salaries to people of course it's this one is again linked to this one which again is linked to this one so again it's typically nothing we need to forecast by itself it's kind of derived through these forecasts and some kind of model in between we will see this later on and finally the book uh, uh, states uh, needs for capacity we can talk, think of this as technology So in order to transform our physical units, we need raw material, we need people to do it, we need capital to kind of fix this, and we also need capital and technology by itself. We need some machines to do certain processing. If you want to produce an iPad or a MacBook Pro, of course we need some aluminium, and we need to process this aluminium to the right size and the right thickness and that kind of stuff. Okay, it's it doesn't come like that from the factory you produce this aluminium. Do you know <coughs> what you buy when you buy aluminium? It's because these big bars, okay? You need to have some kind of machines that kind of pushes those aluminium bars to the right thickness. Or you can cut them or whatever. I don't know how they do it actually. Some kind of technology is needed. But again, this kind of boils down to that demand is kind of the, the prime factor which interests us is interesting in, in uh, logistics. We could perhaps mention that when it comes to forecasting in general, most science subjects deal with forecasting. If you think about economic theory, one of the main points of economic theory, at least macroeconomics, is to try to state future behavior of economical mechanisms. You want to know what happens with the prices on various objects, what happens with interest, that kind of stuff. Okay, that's what a prime candidate in economic theory is to produce forecasts, which then could be used as some kind of uh, guidance for politicians or other guys who might be interested in that. If you think about physics, the same thing there, isn't it? You, you construct a lot of complex mathematical models. Some of them are related to small particles, so small you can't see them, Others are relating to very big particles out in the space and that kind of stuff. But uh, these models have this ability that you can use them to, s to state something about what will happen tomorrow, in a year, in 10 years, in 100 years, and so on. Okay? That's the idea. When it comes to these small particles, this time frame is re relatively short often. Okay? It's, uh, but if you think about astrophysics, then of course it's a matter of much more time. When will the next aster asteroid hit the Earth, for instance? That is an obvious interesting question for, m for most of us, and which these guys have models to kind of try to predict. You think about bi biology, same there, you, you try to build models which give statements on future behavior of various animals, fish and so on. Fish is, of course, especially interesting because it is a kind of animal which you not directly control, at least in, in many cases, if you talk about wild fish. And then the ability to state something about how this number in these species develops is important. And of course, it depends on various stuff, on sea temperature, food in the sea, how much we fish and all that stuff. Okay, so all these variables is then put together in the model, which tries to tell us what will happen in the future, whether we do something or whether we do nothing. If you think about climate research, the same thing there, of course, obviously. The idea is to try to say something of the consequences in the future of the, uh, the kind of mechanisms we seem to believe that is happening now. Okay. 
Should it, is, will there be more storms, more rain? Will the sea rise and all this stuff? So almost all science is related to trying to forecast something. Even in medicine, there are certain elements of forecasting, even though it's not that clear, perhaps. Maybe the only subject which really doesn't elaborate on future is history, which of course elaborate on the opposite, which is the past. Okay. But even in history, they tend to use methods which are kind of forecast oriented. They you could ask the question, what would happen in Germany if Hitler didn't wouldn't be there, for instance. Okay, then in a sense, you, you try to forecast the past. Uh, what would happen? So, so, so these questions of trying to produce forecasts are very typical in most science. And of course, it should be the same thing in logistics. But uh, apart from most other science subjects, it's kind of limited what we really are interested in forecasting in logistics. So we kind of basically only deal with one variable, which is demand. Okay, do we have any questions so far? No, the textbook asks this kind of rhetorical question. Can all variables be predicted or forecasted? Uh, in principle, all variables can be predicted. The, the question should perhaps be rephrased. Can all variables be forecasted or predicted good? Uh, another science subject which obviously only deals with forecasting is meteorology, isn't it? You know, and you want to make weather forecasts, that is basically what you do. And we all probably know that the quality of these forecasts are not necessarily very good, especially if you look in a fairly, not very distant, but in a few days ahead. Today they kind of produce five day warnings, they produce ten day forecasts, but if you kind of look at these forecasts, you will fairly soon observe that they, they are not very precise. So that means that uh, in many cases we should not expect our forecasts to kind of hit. So if we, if we want to forecast the number of people buying tickets for the next Molde match on Sunday against Wordrengo, then uh, we can of course, okay, maybe it's 5,000, maybe it's between five and 10,000. That seems like a, a reasonable. On the other hand, trying to hit exactly would be very difficult, wouldn't it? We can guess 7,243, 8,164 and so on. But the idea is perhaps not to hit exactly. The idea is perhaps to try to get some capture of what will happen so that you don't miss completely. So, so we should not expect our forecasts to be very good. In addition, the textbook points at certain mechanisms which somebody feel are really random. If a mechanism is really random, then we cannot forecast it, can we? That's kind of the definition of a random mechanism. So if we toss a coin, and if we accept that that is a random mechanism, then we cannot predict what will happen. That's impossible. We can say that with a probability half it will be one outcome, or the other with the same probability. That is not a forecast, that is a probability density. A forecast is a number stating. So if, on the other hand, if I constructed a certain device, some kind of mechanism, where I could control the elevation and the force behind this, instead of using my hand, then I'm fairly certain that I could tune my device in such a manner that I could forecast what would happen. Do you see my point? I construct some kind of device which tosses this coin instead of use doing it myself. And of course I have some tunes on this device, I can get more power, change the elevation, control for air resistance and all that stuff, then in principle at least it should be possible to, to make a non-random process in that case. There are however other processes that actually should be random. One of those is the stock market. You know what the stock market is? We buy shares and we sell them, we may earn money or lose money. So we, we kind of buy a, a share of a, a company by buying a share. Uh, 
Presumably, the assumption here is that the stock market behaves like a so-called random walk, meaning that it either goes up with a certain probability or down with a certain probability. Uh, given that assumption, uh, uh, it should be fairly clear, at least in my opinion, that if, it, if, if, it, if that mechanism is not like that, if it kind of behaves in a way that is predictable, then somebody should be able to reveal that pre predictability and with the consequence of earning an infinite amount of money. Do you agree? If I'm able to, alone, to predict the stock market, of course I can invest when the stock is low and sell when it's high. In that case I make a profit. And I can continue doing that, as long as I don't reveal my secret. And if that kind of mechanism should be present in the long term of a stock market, of course the stock market must break down. So as long as we have stock markets, it, it's kind of an indication that this kind of process really at least has certain random elements. And in that aspect, we must expect that certain of the things we want to predict have contents which are really random, which we really cannot expect to predict. So you see my point? Uh, there are certain elements around here which uh, may influence demand which are really random. And in that case, we must expect that we kind of miss. Sometimes we overestimate, sometimes we underestimate. But the idea is to try to get a, a grasp of this, this kind of uh, difference and try to be able to, to, uh, to put numbers into it anyway. Some forecast characteristics in addition to what we have discussed so far. <coughs> This one is a kind of a consequence of what we discussed previously. Normally, wrong. So we, we really can't expect to hit. Okay, that's uh, not necessarily our objective. Of course, the closer we get, the better in a sense, but, uh, but still we must expect uh, a miss. The second one, a good forecast is more than a single number. What is the meaning here? Uh, I said uh, previously that it, uh, we could say, for instance, we could state that uh, on the match against Wolverenga we, uh, we are fairly certain that it will be more than 5,000 people paying their tickets and less than 10,000. Of course, we can expand this interval and say that we are really certain that there will be more than 1,000. I believe that's fairly certain. And there will be less than 13,000. Actually, we're, we're fairly certain on that one, isn't it? Because the capacity is only 11,600, so we can change that number immediately, can't we? It could not be more than that. Probably we can even raise this number to 3,000 because, or actually to 5,000 because they have sold 5,000 tickets, uh, season cards, haven't they? So, so we always know there will, will always be 5,000 buying their ticket. So somewhere in between here. But of course, if you are to predict, then we typically would say, okay, uh, my prediction is 7,800 for this match. Uh, and then I could say, okay, and I assume it's between these two boundaries, but I should perhaps put some probabilities here. On how, how probable is it that it's this number? Or maybe I could even narrow this to with, with another probability. I could perhaps set it with 99.99% probability. I'm within these boundaries with this as my prediction or expected value, as you tend to say here. But I could perhaps narrow these intervals, say that with 95% probability. It is between 7,000 and 10,000. And still my estimate for the actual forecast is this 7,800. So, th so this is what kind of we mean with more than a single number. This is the single number, but we should add some more information related to this single number 
to tell those who are interested in the forecast a little bit more about it. If you look at modern weather forecasts, you see that they have this information, don't they? I seem to recall that. So let's have a look. <coughs> then we have to go to a um, site. For instance, the Norwegian. Do you know this? Yr? Yeah. Oh, let's see. Uh, let's go to Molde then, as we are here. And click on Molde here, and then we get up the forecasts. I think we have to go to the long time forecast. Yeah. Do you see these uh, symbols here? Green, yellow, red. They sa say something about the certainty of the forecast. So if it's green, then it's kind of certain. If it's yellow, it's a little bit more uncertain. And red uh, presumably means that it's kind of uncertain. And uh, if you look at these forecasts, you probably also observe that the green is more in the beginning and the red is more in the end. Do you think that is uh, typical? Or it's normally harder to predict longer in the future, isn't it, than short, especially when it comes to weather. A third important point when it comes to forecasting is the following. Let me take these out. Aggregate. Uh. <coughs> are normally better than this aggregate. What do I mean by that? Uh, an aggregate forecast is a kind of a forecast on variables which are put together, typically added together, multiplied together, or kind of joined in one way or another, while a disaggregate is kind of going down in that chain. So if we produce cars and we decide to either produce red or green cars, it's kind of obvious, isn't it, that it's easier to predict the total number of cars we sell. Especially if we change colors. And we expect, it, expect that we, we kind of get a number similar to last month or last year, or whatever it's reasonable to compare with. But uh, going down here, and if we kind of have light green and dark green and so on, the longer down here we go, the harder it's kind of it, it is to fit with our forecast. That seems reasonable, doesn't it? The more specialized it is, the more we kind of expose ourselves for the tastes of our customers. Going upwards here, we, we kind of hedge against our customer tastes. So as long as our car brand is pretty popular, or unpopular for that kind, it doesn't really matter. We expect to sell a certain amount of cars, but how many dark green cars with a very big engine uh, and with the, in a cabriolet fashion is very hard to predict, typically. So, aggregate forecasts are easier to capture than disaggregate. This is a problem in logistics be because we are very often interested in disaggregate level. We are not interested in how many products a company sells, but we are actually interested in how many products of a certain type they sell. So we need to go all the way down in the chain here to get these forecasts. Because if we... You can see that, can't you? If we don't have a prediction on the number of red and the number of green cars, then of course we don't know how much red or green paint to buy, do we? Of course we know the basic tools here, the chassis and the all these other stuff, the wheels and the, yeah, all this what we need, but uh, we actually need this. And if there's dark and light, we also need dark and light and so on. So we need to kind of get our forecasts for demand, typically at the disaggregate level. So again, this tells us that we should not be necessarily very, we should not believe that we are able to get very good forecasts in logistics. That is really not what we should expect. So we, we must kind of stay with what we, we can then get, so to speak. 
Point four here is uh, already mentioned. The longer the horizon, the worse forecasts. At least most in most cases. It could of course be special cases here where we actually can forecast better in a long time than in a short time, but normally that is the case. <coughs> Just a moment. Ah. Doesn't work. Now, in many cases, or actually in most cases, when we use formal models to produce forecasts, meaning mathematical models, then we base our forecasting on historical data. So we have some observations of previous demand numbers, and we use those previous demand numbers to produce future forecasts. But of course, what we need to remember then in that situation is that if future kind of is very changed compared to, to, to the past. And of course, basing our forecast on past information could lead to bigger errors than we really like. So we should try to incorporate information of that kind to kind of adjust some kind of automat automatic forecasts. It's kind of obvious that Apple, when they introduce a new launch of iPhones, expect to sell some of the new ones and some of the old ones. Maybe the total sales of iPhones are kind of constant. But predicting each of those could be uh, challenging. And in that case, if the history is the previous model, then of course, take, do not, if, if you don't take into account the fact that you actually introduce a new brand, then you run into severe problems. <coughs> Okay, this was kind of the basics, a little bit about the nature of forecasts, what they are. Uh, now let's move into some methods, okay, so how to do this really. Okay. Uh, it says here that we should look at two different methods, causal methods and time series methods, and we shall. But uh, before we kind of get to this aggregation level, I, I would like to kind of make another partition in two groups. We could talk about subjective forecasts. And objective forecasts. A subjective forecast is a forecast which is produced typically without using formal mathematical models. Uh, when we did our forecasting for the match, that could be kind of a subjective forecast. I didn't use any method, I just thought about it, made some arguments, and come up with a forecast of 7,800. If we together were to discuss it, maybe you could change that number. Some of you could perhaps say, okay, I think it. Uh, Molderenga is a nice team. Unfortunately, Molde has performed very bad the last two matches, so there will be less people. So you should perhaps just go for 7,000. And then we could argue and discuss and come up with a number, and that is the forecast we go for. And then we go down to the stadium, buy our sausages, buy our soda cans and whatever, and we arrange the match. In many situations, subjective forecasting is used. And it's used well as well. Especially if you think about the strategic planning discussions, then there's a lot of forecasting going on. What will happen? What do we think will happen? And very seldom we use formal methods. Actually never. We discuss, we agree, or we disagree. In most cases, hopefully, we agree. So you should not 
be mistaken by this course to believe that every kind of forecasting needs a method that's not necessary. In some cases it's much more efficient, maybe even better, to don't use <coughs> a method. But uh, in logistics, when you have uh, a company that produces 50,000 different products, of course you need forecasts and you need uh, to kind of produce them uh, automatically, so to speak. You can't have people arguing, negotiating on forecasts for this vast amount of products. That's, that's really not possible. It would take an enormous amount of time. So you are in some cases you are obviously in need of, of uh, producing automatic forecasts. So this objective forecast is kind of the main topic we will look at here. But it, it's always nice to, to kind of know that uh, this is not necessarily neither the best way to do it, nor the way that it's done. It depends a lot o on the situation. Okay. So we kind of stick to the focus on objective forecasts and then we will discuss these two methods, so to speak. Uh, let's start with the causal methods. Uh, a causal method is a method which tries to explain relations between variables. So there's one variable that interests us, which typically is demand, <coughs> and then we try to find what variables will affect our demand. If we sell flats in Molde, as we briefly discussed last time, we have some feeling for what kind of variables that might be. And maybe the most important one is perhaps the general interest level. If there's a very low interest, we will sell more flats. If there's a high interest, we will sell less flats. The reason is, of course, that most people do not have enough capital to finance a flat without taking a loan. And of course, if you take a loan, the cost of capital is important. Expensive capital, you're more reluctant to take a loan to buy your flat. So you will sell less flats. But again, as we discussed also, there, should be, there could be other variables which expa explains the number of flats sold in Molde. For instance, if there are new products, projects available, they are building new flats, in that case that could reveal some demand. If there is uh, an increase in redecorating flats, that could also lead to more sales, or maybe even less sales if it has a price effect. So the price of the flats is obviously also something which is related here. So if there's a general up, prices are generally going up, then uh, it could perhaps lead to that less flats are sold. On the other hand, it could be an indication that the housing market is good, so it's a good time to invest. So it could actually go in both directions. So the po point with these causal methods is to try to establish links between one or several variables affecting the variable that interests us. So we want to try to build a function. We want to, to build a function, something like this, where the y variable here is the one that interests us. This is our point of forecasting. Well, these variables are the, the variables that explain our forecast. And, uh, and the idea then is in a sense that it must, to some extent, be easier to forecast how these variables develop in the future to make it just just to make it sensible in order to forecast these ones. You see that point? If it's just that hard to forecast these ones, then we might as well forecast this one directly. So they must, in a sense, be easier to forecast this than that. Of course, we could argue, is it easier to forecast the interest level than the number of flats sold in Molde directly? And of course, that's not necessarily an easy question to answer. On the other hand, we have some market information available. There is some future prices and such things, which have some indication on future interest levels. So if you are able to explain the number of flats sold in Molde sim simply by the interest rate, then of course, that is an easy way then to kind of transform our interest rate through a kind of mathematical function into the variable that interests us, the number of sold flats.
The method which we will d discuss is referred to as regression analysis. Some of you may have been into that stuff before, perhaps? Uh, I don't know. Uh, if not, you will get an introduction now. If you know it already, this will be a, a kind of repetition, hopefully in, from in a different way than you saw it previously. But anyway, this is perhaps the most important research tool in modern research. Uh, I would expect that around 75% of all research use regression analysis. All these questionary type of research use it, a lot of economic research do it, so uh, at least in the social science area this tendency to use regression analysis has become too large in my opinion, but uh, it's there, so it's a very important tool to have some knowledge about in any case. And as we will see later on in this course, this regression analysis tool is perhaps much better suited to do event forecasting than these other methods, these time series methods. So uh, it, it's, it's also a reason why we kind of emphasize it uh, a, fair, a, fair, a fair bit in this, in this course. Uh, in general, of course this is a general function, but in most cases we, we kind of look at the linear version of this one. So we, we say we kind of do something like this, we say that y is given as some kind of constant plus another constant times our first variable plus second times our second and so on. Okay, so we kind of define a linear structure. Th this is referred to as linear regression. It's, it's really not a problem to do non-linear regression, but it's in most cases it should be very good reasons before you actually do a non-linear regression. And you should have some real important information related to the fact that you expect a non-linear relation between your variables and, and the output variable in this case. These are often referred to as expl explanatory variables. This could be referred to as the output variable. If we look at a simple linear regression model, then we go even one step down and say we only look at a single variable to explain. So in that case we look at something like this. So we look at a single linear relation. In that case our task when we do regression analysis is to input observations for y and x, so that these are a set of numbers we have, kind of a two vectors or, or uh, rows or, of, uh, of numbers, and uh, the idea is to try to find values for a and b, where, where, where these values makes this function as sensible as possible, so to speak. This will be clearer when we move on. Okay, so let's try to be a little bit more precise here. So in the first uh, setting at least we focus on this situation, so we kind of overlook this one which is referred to as multiple regression and we overlook this one which is kind of a general regression situation. So we can take this out and kind of focus on this simple case some of you may not find it as simple as, as it looks when we start computing here, but uh, that's a different story. Now, <coughs> let's try to be specific. To do this, we need observations. Okay? We need to observe various instances of these y and these x, and they should kind of be coupled. So we have these, <coughs> we need observations so we have these two lines of numbers, we have the x1, we have the x2, and let's say we have n total of the x's, and we have accompanying y's, y2 yn. So if you observe two variables here, let's say in a certain year, if you think about our flat 
in Molde example. Then we could have observed, let's say this year, two, oh, maybe last year, 212, that they were sold 100 flats, and the interest rate last year were 3%. three percent. Okay, there, this is our y, and this is our x, and our first observation would then be x1, y1. Uh, another year we could have another observation, let's say in 2000. In that case, the interest rate rate was kind of higher. Let's say it was 6%. In that case, we probably sold some, some flats, let's say 80. We have this hypothesis here, haven't we, that the higher the interest rate, the less. So there should be some kind of logic link in these numbers, no, if we want to put them up. Let's say in 2006, we had even higher, it was 8%. We sold it less, 75. Like this, okay? These numbers must be present. They are input to our model. So we need to have two parts of numbers representing the thing we look at. These numbers here. Data to our model. Okay, we haven't defined the model yet, but we will do that in due time. <coughs> when we have these numbers, we could uh, make a plot of them, couldn't we? We could kind of plot <coughs> them in an x, y diagram. So let's uh, uh, just skip this number and just make a kind of uh, artificial plot to kind of indicate what might happen here. So let's say we have some observations here. If the x here is the interest rate then, and the y here is the number of flats sold, then we would, we would expect that a high interest rate would return a low number of sold flats, agree? So we get some observation here, maybe something here, maybe something here, here, and maybe here, okay? So this then constitutes one, two, three, four, five observations. x1, y1 here, x2, y2 here, x3, y3 here for instance, x4, y4 here, and x4, 5, y5 here. This uh, crosses is the actual observations plotted in an x, y diagram. Now what we're trying to do here is to look at all possible lines to put in this plane and try to pick one. If we pick a line, then we pick values for A and B, don't we? Because they, they would produce the line we pick. So the idea here is if you look at the line, this line, does this line reflect, reflect these variables good? No. This line? No. This line? Not so bad. But you see, still see that all observations do not fit on the line. So there is certain errors here. Distances between the line we put and the observations. Here is one, here is a small one, here is a bigger one, here is a small one again, and again a small one there. We could put names on these errors, couldn't we? We can call this one epsilon 1, this one epsilon 2, this one epsilon 3, this, oh sorry, no, I missed. I should perhaps use five here, don't you think so? Corresponding with the observation labels, that's better. Epsilon three, epsilon two, epsilon one. So this epsilon is the distance between the line and all we put in subscript here, all observations. Now this means that if we write over line, we cannot, we cannot guarantee that all our observations will hit it, okay? So we need to kind of add an error term to our, our model to adjust for the fact that we may kind of step out of the line. That should mean that our model should change slightly into the following. Yi, a certain observation, 
can be constructed by our line the corresponding x plus or actually minus the error term related to this meaning that this epsilon here could be either positive or negative so we can either choose to use plus or minus here we normally use plus so if you look at this point here now we can get that point can't we by first going to this point in the line then we use this part to get up here we have to add this error term then we reach the point if you look at this error term the same thing we find a point on the line here but we have to subtract an error term in that case so we allow this plus to change to a minus so this model now actually is able to produce any point in the plane here you agree by manipulating this epsilon so if we put a line in the plane we can also construct given a set of observations all these error terms yes could you please get back to the point where you, you said uh, changing the x well, to negative? This one to negative? Yes. Yeah. The point is, of course, that when you have this line, you must allow the fact that you're missing your observation, which misses the line, either you can lie on, lie on top of it or under it. If it's on top, you have to add the distance to get there. If it's on bottom, you have to subtract it. And that is the reason why this epsilon could be positive or negative. Yeah, it's time for a break. Okay.